Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, and Barry, thank you very much for your very kind uh, introduction. Uh, welcome to the uh, Eye Institute and the Diabetes Center. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be, uh, this is very relaxed, informal talk, okay? Uh, the title is A Sugar Night, Blue Light, and Nobel Prize, plus something else. Um, I think being in Southern California, uh, we got to go to many different interesting places uh, close by, but uh, Vegas definitely is one of the places that most of the people probably have uh, visited. Uh, this is a photo I took uh, a few months ago uh, when I was in uh, the Vegas. And uh, this is a place that uh, almost never sleep, right? And uh, you can do uh, whatever you want uh, anytime you want, around the clock. Um, you can stay up all night, uh, you can eat whatever you want, and party uh, late into the night. Is this a problem? Well, it might be a problem, and I'll explain to you why uh, later on today. Now, before I get started uh, on the topic, I would like to uh, talk about why we have diabetes, the cause of diabetes, okay? I've, I'm gonna start with the type one diabetes. There are two different kinds of diabetes. One is type one diabetes, and the other kind is type two diabetes. Type one diabetes is because you have destruction of the insulin producing cell located in the pancreas. There are little islands inside the pancreas that we call pancreatic islets. And if you blow it up, this is what the islet looks like. There are various different kinds of cell, alpha cell, beta cell, delta cell, and so forth. Insulin is only produced in the cell called beta cells, the blue cells that produce insulin. In the case of type 1 diabetes, the immune system attack the islets, and therefore they destroy the insulin producing cell, the beta cells. So you don't have much left. Most of the beta cell will be, will be dead. And as a result, the body cannot produce enough insulin, and insulin is the hormone that keeps the glucose down and therefore you have type 1 diabetes, okay? This type of diabetes uh, can occur in the young children, but can also occur in uh, adult patients. There are many symptoms of diabetes. So when you first come down with the diabetes, uh, sometimes you might know you have diabetes, but sometimes you don't really don't know you have diabetes because some of these symptoms are really non-specific. For example, uh, people who have diabetes tend to uh, eat a lot and drink a lot, feeling thirsty all the time. Okay? You might feel a little bit tired and uh, not feeling well. Um, there is another sign of diabetes is uh, losing weight. If you experience a lot of weight loss, uh, that could be a sign that you might have diabetes. And your eye become blurred because of high blood sugar mess up the lens uh, inside the eye and those, these people, the, uh, when your blood sugar is high, then you feel your vision is not as good. In your breast, if the diabetes is uh, going on uh, for a while and the blood sugar becomes really high, uh, there will be a rise of a chemical called acetone in the circulation. And it's kind of fruity flavor, fruity smell. So if you get close to a person, you feel you are smelling fruits. Uh, that could be a sign of severe diabetes, okay? And then uh, when the sugar is really high and you got into this ketoacidosis situation, you can feel like to throw up and could have abdominal pain. This could be the first symptom that you have severe diabetes. So how high blood sugar occurs? There are many organs and many tissues within the body that can contribute to high blood sugar. Uh, one of the things we just talked about is pancreas because pancreas make insulin and insulin lower blood sugar. So if you don't have enough insulin secretion, the blood sugar will go high. Muscle is the main organ that consume uh, blood sugar. So when you have high blood sugar, the sugar is supposed to go to the uh, 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 muscle and when you exercise, the sugar, you would uh, get burned off or in the muscle and therefore lower blood sugar levels. If you eat a lot of food, uh, you would digest all the carbohydrate and the carbohydrate will become blood sugar. When you become obese, 
if your body weight increase and you have a lot of adipose tissue, the insulin is not gonna work well and that can produce high glucose. The kidney is also one of the organs that contribute to the regulation of blood sugar. It's very important. And now we think that this is a big component of type two diabetes. Liver is another one. Um, sometime patient asks me, you know, I don't eat anything after dinner and then throughout the night, I don't really don't eat anything at all except drinking water. But when I wake up in the morning, even before I eat breakfast, my sugar is high. Why is that? Well, this is because of the liver. Because liver is the organ that can generate blood sugar. They can turn uh, a it's, it's chemical called glycogen into uh, glucose, that's sugar, and then release it to the bloodstream and therefore raise your blood sugar when you wake up in the morning. The quarterback in all this complex mechanism is the brain. Brain is very important in coordinating all the organs and make sure the glucose is under control. So we now have a lot of evidence, especially in the case of type two diabetes, uh, brain could be a key player in the development of type two diabetes. And I'm gonna get into that in a sec, okay? I just wanna show you uh, two scientists at the UCI, Dr. Kehalan and Dr. Ray, uh, um, Dr. Chandy. Uh, they have been working on this thing for over 30 years and later on when I joined UCI, I also uh, kind of uh, contribute a little bit to this effort. Um, they develop, identify a chemical that it produced in a special kind of sea anemone. And this is chemical can block a protein in the white blood cells. Okay, why this is important? Because white blood cell is part of the immune system and white blood cell can attack the islet cells in the pancreas and destroy the insulin producing cells. And if the insulin producing cell is destroyed, this is how type one diabetes occur. So they develop a new drug called uh, Delazatai. This drug is now being tested in the clinical trials. And we should learn the result uh, in the next few years. We talk about type one diabetes, but type two diabetes is somewhat different from type one. Type two diabetes is because of two things. First of all, type two diabetes patients usually have significant insulin resistance, meaning that even if you produce insulin, the body is not sensitive to insulin. And therefore, uh, the blood sugar become higher. On top of it, many of the patients have abnormal beta cells. So the insulin secretion from the beta cells is not up to par with the combination of inadequate insulin production and insulin resistance because of the, our genetic makeup or because of our lifestyle and diet, this patient can have type two diabetes. Okay. Now, if you talk about type two diabetes, we have to talk about obesity because these two things frequently go together. There are many different kinds of fat inside the body. Uh, some, are, some fats are good and some fats are bad. Not all fats are bad. The fat under the skin, that's what we call subcutaneous fat, actually it's not too bad. The really bad fat is the ab intra-abdominal fat. That's the fat in the belly. So it's like a beer belly, okay? This is the kind of fat that can mess up the pancreas and can create significant insulin resistance. Uh, this is a photo I took in uh, 24 uh, with a fitness center in uh, Huntington Beach. Uh, you um, drive the car, park in the parking lot, and then uh, use the escalator uh, to get into the fitness center to exercise. And perhaps this is the evolution of human, okay? <laughs> now we are at the very end. Well, this slide shows you the prevalence of diabetes from 2004 to 2010. 
in a short six years. The darker the red is, meaning that there in, in that specific county, uh, there is uh, increase, there is higher uh, prevalence of diabetes. So the darker the red is, the worse it is. And let's, let's look at it just in short, six short years. Okay, uh, many places turn red. And this is why we are having diabetes epidemic uh, in 2018. And this has become a significant public health issue. Well, how significant it is. First of all, now there are 29 million children and adults in the US has diabetes, who represent one in 11 Americans now has diabetes. Okay. And um, there are 86 million Americans who have pre-diabetes. This is a precursor into diabetes who may become diabetes in the future. And every 23 seconds, someone in the United States is being diagnosed with diabetes. Okay. If you look at the economical cost, right now per year, the cost for diabetes is $322 billion per year uh, for United States. So what does $322 billion mean? It's the market size, market value of Johnson & Johnson. It's a big company. So each year we burn a Johnson & Johnson in the United States just because of diabetes. To make things worse, the average price of insulin increased nearly uh, three-four between 2002 and 2013. Okay. The, even the same type of insulin, um, it's the price increased 300% uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, there are only three companies right now in the world who make insulin. Uh, but I think in the future, the situation might become better as we have more and more generic insulin come onto the market. Well, I frequently say what's terrible about diabetes is not just the high blood sugar. What's terrible about diabetes is the long-term complications of diabetes. Um, diabetic patients really, really pass away because of high blood sugar per se. Uh, people pass away because of complications of diabetes. Okay. Uh, what are the complications? Stroke, high blood pressure, heart attack, heart disease, atherosclerosis, kidney complications, neuropathy, <coughs> gangrene, amputations, erectile dysfunction in men, uh, and uh, gastroparesis, which is a uh, digestive problem. And in diabetic patients, sometimes you throw up and food cannot pass down. You already take your insulin shot, but the food is not going through, then you got low blood sugar. It's a significant problem. There is also a very important complication of diabetes, which is the eye complications. And I'm going to leave that very important part to Dr. Cooperman. He's going to come on the stage in a few minutes. Now, I want to switch gear and talk about something called circadian rhythm. This is the circle of life. Okay? As humans evolve over millions of years, we got sync into our environment and the day and night cycle changes. Let's just quickly look at this. Okay. I'm sorry, okay, good. When you rise in the morning, the blood pressure uh, went up. So there is a sharp rise at blood pressure in about six, uh, about seven o'clock in the morning. And then by 7.30, uh, there is a hormone called melatonin. This is a sec a made in the brain. The secretion stop because this is the a hormone that will make you go to sleep. So it will stop to make you go, uh, uh, to make you wake up. And then there should be a bowel movement somewhere likely after you get up around 8.30. The highest uh, level of testosterone, testosterone secretion occur at about nine o'clock in the morning. And there are some people who believe that this is the best time uh, to have sex. Um, by 10 o'clock in the morning, you are at the most alert state uh, throughout 24 hour period of time. So if you wanna take an exam or doing any kind of business deal, this could be the best time. And then after you have lunch, uh, you have the best coordination and fastest reaction time around 
and then there will be great cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength around uh, five o'clock in the afternoon. So if you want to challenge somebody to a tennis match, maybe late afternoon will be a good time. Okay. The blood pressure high again, uh, rise again at 6.30, and then the highest body temperature is around seven o'clock at night. And then by nine o'clock, try to prepare you to go to bed, uh, the melatonin will start uh, starts and then the bowel movement will become pretty suppressed. And you reach the deepest sleep at two o'clock in the morning. And the cycle uh, repeat again itself. This circadian cycle is controlled by the brain. The brain has a clock. This is a central clock located in the brain. That then react with the peripheral clock. What the peripheral clock? The, the heart has a clock, pancreas has a clock, liver has a clock, Everything else has a clock, and everything has to be coordinated with the clock in the brain. Okay. And this then has to be synced with your eating behavior, because when you're out of sync, there could be a price to pay, which is it can mess up the metabolism, mess up the liver, mess up the skeletal muscle, mess up your pancreas in its ability to secrete insulin, and you might gain weight. Last year, there are three scientists got awarded with a Nobel Prize in medicine. And what did they do? Well, they study circadian rhythm. Okay. And this is what the Nobel Assembly says. Life on Earth is adapted to the rotation of our planet. For many years, we have known that living organisms, including humans, have internal biological clock that helps them anticipate and adapt to the regular rhythm of the day. Okay. So this is the new paradigm in medicine and science that we have to pay attention to. So how does it regulate it? It is regulated through the light, the day and night cycle. When we see the light, the light hit the back of the eye in the retina and then send the signal through optic nerve into the clock inside the brain. The brain then coordinate, send the signal to the peripheral clocks in the heart, in the liver, and the rest of the body uh, to ensure that the whole thing is synchronized. Okay. But it turned out that not all the light are the same. There are different light, uh, different kind of wavelengths in the light spectrum. We know there is a blue light, red light, yellow light, and so forth. Our eye, in terms of circadian rhythm, is only sensitive to the blue light, okay? Not to the yellow light or orange light. So you think about it, if you just sit next to a campfire or sit next to a fireplace, it's perfectly okay. It will not affect your circadian rhythm. But if you look at your cell phone, you look at TV and look at plenty of LED light, or if you go to Vegas, there are a lot of neon light, they all have significant amount of blue light, then it'll become a problem. This is what happens when it's not synced. When everything is synced, the central clock is synced with peripheral clock. And then ideally, you have to sync with the bright light during the daytime and sleep at night, of course. And then the food intake had better to be during the daytime because in the old days, after the sunset, you are not supposed to eat. And our body uh, already adapt to it, okay? When you are out of sync, you st well, not we, you are out of sync. We are all out of sync at night, I mean, in a way. We all eat at night and sleep during the daytime and have artificial light at night. So everything is being aligned. And the result is we can become obese, gaining weight, and get diabetes, get cardiovascular disease. Okay. So this is my last slide. Okay. This is a cute experiment that was done in a script research clinic. And I will just quickly walk you through it. Okay. What they did was they take the obese mice. This is the mice that is genetically obese. They have a genetic defect and can quickly become obese. They divide the obese mice into two different groups. One, they can eat around the clock whenever they want through a 24-hour period. 
And then another group is time restricted. They only eat when they are supposed to eat. Although the, uh, the amount of food they eat in this group and this group are the same, but the time of eating are different. And this is the result. If you, if the, you give them access to food anytime they want, they become very obese and they have diabetes. If time restricted, although they are overweight, but they are fit and the blood sugar is not elevated. What happened to the normal limb mice? Well, again, you divide them in the same two groups. In those groups that uh, where they can eat whenever they want, they become obese and the sugar becomes slightly elevated. If you time restrict their eating pattern, they are lean, they are fit, and they don't have diabetes. And this is perhaps the curious, and I think it offers some hope for us. Why is that? If you take the limb mice, okay, and then make them eat when they are supposed to eat, time restrict their e eating, Monday through uh, Friday. And then Saturday and Sunday, let them eat whatever they want around the clock. And the result, they are lean, they are fit, and they don't have diabetes. So I'm going to end here. Okay. Now let's welcome, uh, thank you. Now let's welcome Barry. Dr. Cooperman is going to tell you about eye complications of diabetes. Okay, so I'm going to talk now about the ocular complications of diabetes, but you'll see that it ties in a lot with systemic management too. In fact, Every time I see my diabetic patients with ocular complications or otherwise, just for screening purposes, I always ask them not only how their vision's doing, but I ask them about their systemic health, and in particular, I ask three things. Do they know their hemoglobin A1C? That's that blood test every three months or so, where a good number is 7.0% or less, under 5 point, under 6 is great. Uh, over 10, we worry about. Um, I also ask about their blood pressure and ask them, usually I just ask them about their cholesterol because people know their cholesterol by and large, even though we care about their whole lipid profile. So those all contribute to this. So, and then I also interact a lot with the endocrinologists and the di diabetologists and the internists in the management of these patients. So this is where we have a strong collaboration. Um, uh, this is all, tend to have disclosure. We do, I do a lot of research with a lot of companies. So diabetic retinopathy is the generic term for this. The, well, let me focus on this. I'm a retina specialist. What I am not gonna be talking about tonight, because I'll run out of time, but I can address it, is that diabetics have a higher risk than the general population of developing cataracts. That's the lens inside the eye, that's close to the front of the eye, inside the eye, that the most common type of cataract is from aging. But the second most common is from diabetes. Of course, as diabetics age, then they have both contributing to it, both their age and their diabetes. I won't really address that except to say that the cataract surgery that a diabetic undergoes for their cataract is identical to the cataract surgery that an, uh, somebody who got it from age-related purposes. So there, and, but what di that cataract surgery can do is stir the pot of their retinopathy, which is what I'll be talking about, the, the complications in the retina. When you do the cataract surgery, it can make the retinopathy worse. So I'll be focusing on that. So diabetic retinopathy is the blanket term to talk about all the blood vessels in the back of the eye. The retina is the inside back lining of the eye. It's like the film in the camera, the chip in the camera, lining the back of the eye. It captures the images that are projected onto it. It's partially processed and the retina is actually 10 layers deep. It's like a thin shell of a brain because it has nerve connections in it. It does partial processing of information and sends it up to the brain to the optic nerve. So to do all that activity, it needs blood supply. And so all those blood vessels, it's very easy to think about diabetes as a disease of blood sugar. From my perspective as a retinologist, I think of diabetes as a disease of blood vessels. Every blood vessel in a diabetic begins to be altered. The lining of the blood vessel thickens up, so when you've got really tiny blood vessels that are going to the retina, if the lining is thickened up, then the central core, the lumen, where the blood flows, gets really narrowed down. And it begins to develop other abnormalities. So again, this is a huge ca cause of vision loss in the working age group. Again, as we've seen, this is a diabetic, it, I'm sorry, it's an epidemic, excuse me, not just in the United States, 
in Asia. Unfortunately, we've had a negative impact on the world and many positive impacts, but our fast food diet is delicious and enjoyable and it's going all over the world and uh, people are adopting it and as a result, ob obesity is a consequence of that and diabetes follows thereafter as we've seen. And with the more diabetics you have, the more eye disease. It's a known association. As Dr. Wang mentioned, there's a variety of, of uh, complications of diabetes. The three most feared ones are diabetic retinopathy on the, in the eye, diabet diabetic nephropathy in the kidneys, that's what leads to dialysis, and then diabetic neuropathy, that's the tingling in the fingers and toes that can lead to ulcers. Uh, of, of, the, uh, of the limbs, et cetera, can lose to amputations, et cetera. So all those are, the, those are the three most feared complications, and you can see the numbers, how they're growing, not just in North America, to the 2015 to 2040, that, it's about a 5% increase, but all over the world, South America, Europe, it's growing everywhere. One third of all diabetics have retinopathy. Now the retinopathy can be mild. Just because you have retinopathy doesn't mean you're blind or gonna go blind. You can have a little specks, a couple specks of blood, but the fear is that over its retinopathy is, in a certain sense, a clock measuring how long you've got diabetes. The longer you have diabetes, the greater the risk of having retinopathy. The longer you have retinopathy, the greater risk of it progressing. So it's really just a matter of time, ultimately. Though some people, it moves very slowly, and they're never bothered by it. Others, it moves more rapidly. And sadly, even though we exhort you, pay diabetics to control their blood sugar, blood pressure, and lipids, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Just because you behave well doesn't mean you're, you won't have complications of diabetes. It's meant to change your statistics. If you looked at a group of 5,000 people or 10,000 people, those that have better control of their diabetes do overall better. But any one individual, there's people that are drinking and carousing, going to Las Vegas with Ping every weekend and, <laughs> and staying up all night, and they're skinny. And their diabetes doesn't get bad. And there's others that are church-going mice, and they follow all the rules, and they got bad diabetic retinopathy. But statistically, if you, the better you behave, statistically, you're stacking the deck in your favor. I think that's an important point to make, that it's not a guarantee, but it does increase your odds. Again, diabetes is a huge burden on the Western healthcare system. Again, two to six-fold risk in cardiovascular mortality, leading cause of end-stage renal disease, blindness, and lower extremity applications. I left off the cardiovascular mortality, that's the other big feared thing, is all the heart complications, of course. And again, what's associated with diabetes duration? Your hemoglobin A1C, that's that measure of blood sugar, how it's performed over a three month period of time. I care about that more than the fasting blood sugar. I appreciate that people check their fasting blood sugar, but that's like a pop quiz. The three month hemoglobin A1C is more like a midterm or a semester final. It tells you over a longer period of time how you performed. Hypertension, ethnicity, and blood and uh, lipids can alter the, are enhancers, they boost the diabetes. And diabetic macular edema, DME, is the main cause of decreased visual acuity in working individuals, and it's most common in type 2 diabetes. We've already seen this, a slide like this, the ping show, it's a huge uh, economic burden throughout the world. And amongst the reasons it's a huge economic burden is the diabetics that have diabetic macular edema, that is the the, and I'll describe macular edema a little bit, but let me use that, since I'm using that term, I should explain that. Not just any spots in blood, but diabetic macular edema is swelling in the back of the eye, in the retina, right in the center of your retina. The central retina, if you imagine the back of the eye as a dome, the apex of that dome, right in the middle of it, is the macula. That's just a subset of the retina that corresponds to central vision. And diabetic macular edema is swelling right in the middle, and that causes blurry vision, and that needs to be treated. And the patient, the diabetics with diabetic macular edema have a lot other health problems, so they utilize the resources much more so than diabetics that do not have diabetic macular edema. So the macular edema, the loss of vision in the eye from diabetes, is like a canary in the coal mine, telling you that you're at risk for all these other complications of diabetes. Or maybe they're all canaries in coal mines for each other. The ones that have diabetic macular edema also have the kidney problems, also have the foot neuropathy problems, perhaps, and the cardiovascular problems, because they tend to go frequently together, and that's what this graph is meant to show. So the, let's talk a little bit about what that is. So no, DR stands for diabetic retinopathy. That's abnormalities in the blood vessels of the retina. And here you can see there's the optic nerve, 
and there's all these blood vessels we're talking about. On this scale, the retina would fill up this entire front wall and come around to back half, half, of, the, half of this room. That's how magnified this is. This is about one millimeter across. And you can see, and the macula, central retina is over here. This is it over here. You can see a blood, spot of blood there, a spot of blood there, a spot of blood there. That's non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. That's what NPDR stands for. NPDR is just abnormal blood vessels that start leaking, but they're not starting to grow new blood vessels, which is what PDR is, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, where new blood vessels grow, and they grow out into the vitreous gel. The vitreous gel can pull on them, and bleeding happens throughout the eye. And either one of these two, either NPDR or PDR, either one of these manifestations can lead to swelling in the center of the retina, the macular edema. And the chemical, the growth factor that seems to be most important is called VEGF, right here, V-E-G-F, vascular endothelial growth factor. And it's rather fascinating that the three most common retinal diseases that, that retina specialists take care of are macular degeneration, which has two forms, dry and wet. Wet is because of abnormal blood vessels. Diabetic retinopathy caused by abnormal blood vessels and retinal vein occlusion caused by abnormal blood vessels. All three of them are treated with the same chemicals, uh, drugs that we use that inhibit that lower VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor levels. The big three are Avastin. The drugs that we use are Avastin, Lucentis, and Ilea, for any of you that uh, may have heard of those. And so that's, we use that because we've seen that it's inflammation, but VEGF is a key factor in that inflammatory process. And in fact, we grade, when I look inside the retina of somebody with diabetic retinopathy, we grade their level of retinopathy, and here's one that's completely normal. There's the optic nerve, the blood vessels, and that's the macula. That slight increased pigment, that's normal. Then if you look, there's just a few little blood spots right there. And as you can see, it gets worse and worse. This is when it gets to be still non-proliferative. There's not new blood vessels growing, but there's spots of blood everywhere. And then as you come over here, now there's new blood vessels growing and it gets worse and worse. Here you can see a lot of blood vessels growing and then they get pulled on and this is a bunch of blood inside the eye. It's called a boat-shaped hemorrhage because it looks like a sailing boat or the hull of a boat because it layers out inside the eye. And that's that scale that happens over time. So again, this is a clock. Early on when you're diagnosed with diabetes, this is what it looks like. But unfortunately, over time you will progress. You may not go very far. You might only progress to here over years and years. Others will progress all the way in a relatively short amount of time. But controlling your diabetes, controlling your blood pressure, controlling your lipid levels will statistically increase the chance that you will not progress as far. So when you get swelling in the center, again, this is the optic nerve, and this is the center of the retina. The center of the macula is called the fovea. So it's macular edema is swelling right in the very center, and that's what we care about. If the swelling happens over here, we don't really notice it. Over here, we don't really notice it. When it's smack dead center, that's when we notice it. And this is just how we measure it. It can be measured in different ways, but it's leakage in the middle. And in cross section, we have now new technology, the optical coherence tomography, the imaging that we do, not so new any longer, about 10 years old, but it scans through the back of the eye, those 10 layers, and rotates and look at it in cross section, and you can see swelling. You can see that big spot there of swelling. You can see this dip, which is normal, but there's still a lot of leakage throughout here and a lot of leakage in the middle. That's a sign of the diabetic retinopathy on the swelling, the macular edema. And again, it's driven by VEGF, we discovered, and in fact, that discovery was made by an Italian physician who was a scientist working at Genentech in San Francisco, uh, Napoleon Ferrara, and he not only discovered that the role of VEGF, um, there was another uh, famous scientist, Judah Folkman at Harvard Medical School, the two of them separately discovered the role of VEGF, but Napoleon Ferrara also discovered a way to inhibit the antibody to VEGF, and that's Avastin that we use. Um, again, and, and VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, causes leaking of blood vessels as well as new blood, ve new blood vessel growth angiogenesis. And again, here's ranibizumab. This is, so this here is, right here, the full monoclonal antibody, Avastin, the, to VEGF. The, the antibody to, to VEGF is called Avastin, and that's what uh, Dr. Farrar discovered at Genentech. And then uh, there, he subsequently then cut it, made it smaller so that it would be a smaller subunit, that's Lucentis. That's the other one of the molecules we use. And then the third one is Ilea. And that's what we inject in the eye. Here's the Avastin. 
And I'll show you a case to give you an example. This is from a course I taught with uh, Anata Mikhaila, who are from uh, Tel University of Tel Aviv, but a patient who has diabetic macular edema, and this is what it looks like. This is the right eye, and look at all the swelling in the back of the eye, whereas the left eye has beginning to have a little swelling, but you see this is very normal contour, that dip is normal, and a little bit of leakage. And so we tried injecting. They tried injecting Avastin three times, and it was still leaking. Meanwhile, the left eye began to leak more. And so this, in this case, the Avastin didn't work, so they switched drugs and gave a steroid, something called Ozodex, but it doesn't matter. They could have switched from one thing to another. But then so they injected that, and you can see what it looked like a month later, and two months, and uh, 11 weeks later, look how beautiful. That's completely dry. That, all, after all that swelling, you can look, the left eye got worse before they injected. They injected, and they got a beautiful response. So these are both completely dried out retinas after injecting of drugs, and it can happen with ILEA, it can happen with Avastin, it can happen with Lucentis, or with steroids. In this case, it was steroids. But none of the drugs last forever, and when you wait long enough, it recurs, and you can see the swelling once again, and the vision goes down when they're swelling. Then they re-inject it, and you can see it controlled again. Here it's swelled up again, re-inject it, controls again, and vision improves. So it's this cycling that we play. That's why we need to follow patients with diabetic retinopathy, diabetic macular edema, every one, two, or three months, depending on their cycle, we inject on an as-needed basis. The steroid tends to last longer, so I like it, but it can create cataracts and increase the pressure in the eye, so I tend to defer using that. I like to use ILEA or Lucentis or Avastin first, but if they're not getting a good response, then I'll switch to this Ozodex here, but it's how we manage this disease state with great success. Now, separately, besides the macular edema, the other disease state we have to manage is the new blood vessel formation. So I said the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy is just the old blood vessels that begin to leak and ooze, the spots of blood. But new blood vessels can grow in response to VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, and those are the ones that grow out into the vitreous gel and they get pulled on. You can see bleeding here, here, you can see all this blood in front of it, and they can develop scarring, and that's what this white is here, and blood vessels on the iris in the front of the eye. So that's the problem, what's called neovascularization, new blood vessels. There's another term that's similar, angiogenesis, the creation of new blood vessels. But here we tend to refer to this as neovascularization that can happen of the retina, can happen to the optic nerve, which is right over here, you can see the optic nerve, or it can happen in the iris. And that can cause, when it's in the iris, it can cause a form of glaucoma, a very unique form of glaucoma, called uh, neovascular glaucoma, glaucoma caused by new blood vessels. It's not the typical glaucoma. Most people that have glaucoma have what's called open angle glaucoma, and they use the drops and it controls it. Some people, the second most common are those that have narrow angle glaucoma. Whenever you hear an advertisement for medication and, they, there's, and then there's all those disclaimers of all the things that can cause insanity, cancer, et cetera, and blindness, it's from narrow angle glaucoma. And usually you use a laser on the iris to punch a hole in the iris to balance out the fluid back and forth, and that cures it. And then the third, but distant third most common, is this neovascular glaucoma, glaucoma caused by new blood vessels, typically by diabetes or by a vein occlusion. And what do we do when we see uh, that, those new blood vessels? We laser. So this used to be all a beautiful orange retina, and we put in a ton of laser spots because there was bleeding. And so you can see there's the blood, but we put laser spots in around that. And even though we also give the injections, we're in a transition right now. We give the injections for the swelling, the diabetic macular edema, but for the new blood vessels, the proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we're in transition. We still like the laser because it's kind of, it lasts, seems to last well, but we know the injections work, but we're worried that what if somebody doesn't show up next month or the month after? Whereas the laser, they could go months and months without needing an injection. And here, this is an example. You can see this one here. You can see some blood right there. This is the optic nerve with lots of extra blood vessels. Not all these are the normal ones. And after laser, you can see some of the laser spots off to the side there. You can see the optic nerve has many fewer blood vessels. That sheet of blood vessels there has largely dissipated, and it's back to more of a normal appearance to a retina specialist. So again, what are our recommendations? And I'll close here in a few minutes, in a minute or two, and we can take questions. What do we recommend for adults with diabetes? A hemoglobin A1C of less than 7%. We typically like that. We should individualize that, the duration of diabetes, the age, life, and expectancy, the other conditions the person has, how many comorbidities, other complications. 
uh, if they have a uh, known uh, co coronary uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, and these are the things that we worry about uh, as we adjust the recommendations for hemoglobin A1C. We want blood pressure to be in the 140 over 180 or less range. LDL cholesterol typically to be under 100, HDL cholesterol um, uh, to be over 40, that's the good cholesterol, and triglycerides to be under 150. And again, we do screening. So what are the recommendations for screening? I can tell you that the simple answer is we tell diabetics to come in once a year. The reality is that may not be actually exactly efficient. You may not need to come in every year, every other year may be enough, but if you don't come in every year, it's easy to forget. So the advantage of the once a year is that you sort of remember that February is your month. So you know every February you should get in to see the eye doctor. So it's an easier to remember that cycle than remembering, well, it may be every two years. So again, that's to say every two years may be considered. That is more efficient from a cost efficiency, but I worry that it doesn't take into account the human psyche and, and the easy, how easy it is to forget to come in. But I do, again, we do recommend regular screening. And again, life for a patient with diabetic macroedema, again, when they have that complication, can become very complicated. Um, so if, if you see in patients age 40 or more years, 30% have diabetic retinopathy, about 13% have diabetic macroedema, 8% have stroke if they're over the age of 35. That's very young to be having a stroke. But Again, this is the risk that diabetics have. 20% of cardiovascular disease if the, uh, of the, in the population over 35. Again, a very young pop, uh, cutoff for cardiovascular disease. 33% uh, have diabetic nephropathy, the condition in the kidneys that I mentioned to you that can lead to dialysis. And 60 to 70% develop diabetic neuropathy. Again, that tingling in the fingers and toes that can lead this consequence of poor circulation. In the fingers and toes that is a consequence can lead to ulcers in the fingers and toes and amputations, et cetera. So again, this is a complexity of life with diabetes. That's why it takes a lot of attention and care. We'd, lie, we'd rather see you more often than less often because it, we just want to be vigilant as we can to make sure we're getting the, uh, you're getting the very best care possible, the diabetic. So to conclude, diabetic retinopathy and macroedema is the main cause of decrease in visual acuity in the working age population. And it's a significant economic burden for healthcare systems in the developed world. Good control of blood pressure and blood sugar in particular and lipid levels are recommended for preventing or arresting diabetic retinopathy. But I want to clarify that this is not meant to be a guarantee. It increases the statistics in your favor of not having a problem, but it's not a guarantee. It's based on large scale epidemiology, biostatistics, not necessarily individualized, but still those are the goals. Try to do that as much as possible. And inflammation plays a central role. These inflammatory cytokines, this class of compounds that are in the body that respond to, that are a manifestation of inflammation. VEGF is one of the key ones, vascular endothelial growth factor, but there's many others, the interleukins, et cetera. That's why we give anti-VEGF injections, but we also give steroid injections. Again, steroids are bad for diabetics when they're given out throughout the whole body. They can make your blood sugar go crazy, but inside the eye in that very small doses we give, in fact, they can help control the inflammation inside the eye, and that's the direction we're going. So for now, we give, a, unfortunately, for the management of diabetic ocular complications of diabetes, we need regular visits every one, two, or three months, injections on an as-needed basis. Sometimes you need laser as well, but the good news is we're having better and better outcomes all the time, and there's more and more we can offer to uh, the patient population. Thank you very much for your attention. I think you could handle that one. Well, the, the risk is that uh, the pre-diabetes, uh, you have a good chance of progressing into diabetes. And so right now the focus is how to prevent people who have pre-diabetes from progressing into diabetes. Okay? But compared to the overall population, if you have pre-diabetes, uh, there are still higher risk for cardiovascular disease. So we need, still need to pay attention to it. The, again, the, the pre-diabetic complications leading to diabetic retinopathy and, and loss of vision is remote because it's, again, it takes a long time from pre-diabetes to develop diabetes. And typically, 
people with diabetes don't show any manifestations in the eyes for the first 10 years. They can, but they typically don't. So really, in a certain sense, the ocular complications, I didn't mention this before, but probably should have, is most commonly seen after 20 years of diabetes. It can happen much sooner, but that's when we expect to see it. But if you then imagine you're going to be a pre-diabetic for five years, and then a diabetic for many years before you might manifest the retinopathy, you have a good chance of doing well, but it takes screening and evaluation just to make sure because some people accelerate more rapidly than others. Some people develop the diabetic retinopathy more, uh, sooner than others. But by and large, it's a, it's a slow path. Correct. Let's see, I was going to try to go escape in here. Let's go back and show that picture of the, of the lasered retina. And that's as part of, so even though we feel more comfortable with lasering the retina, the reality is, is, oh, let's see, is that everywhere that we laser, we damage the retina. Now, the macula is still preserved, so you've got great central vision, but you have, can have a loss of peripheral vision. And the worst part about it is that that's not, this is a, these are pretty old laser spots. When you first put the laser spots in, they're only this big, but they, they tend to expand over, si over time. And when you put in 1,500 of them, and they all double in size, suddenly you start really losing peripheral vision. So that's the trade-off. In the study that was done, um, where they compared the injections of Lucentis or Ilea or Avastin compared to the laser, we were shocked, quite honestly, because the ones that got the injection did so well, did better than those that got the laser. The trouble is that people in clinical trials tend to behave better than people that are not in clinical trials, and people in clinical trials tend to behave better when they're in the trial than when they're not in the trial. They show up. They feel compelled or committed, et cetera. So that's the fear we have of not putting in laser is that without laser, they may bleed. So it's this trade-off. So what we're doing is kind of trying to, to thread the needle. We, I put in half the laser spots I used to put in because I'm giving injections from time to time as well. Now, there's two types of laser that, that have been done historically. I didn't show you because we've kind of abandoned the laser to the macula. But in addition, before, about 10 years ago, when we started getting the anti-VEGF injections, Lucentis, Ilea, and Avastin, we used to put in little, tiny, very mild laser spots wherever there was leakage. And those little, teeny, mild spots can also expand over time. So I've got patients that have lost central vision because of the laser spots that were put in. I've now practiced here for 25 years, and so when I first came here, uh, you know, 25 years ago, I'd look inside and said, who's the crazy person putting those laser spots? But now, 25 years later, it's, I'm the crazy person to put in those laser spots because over time, they expand. So again, this is the ones that we're most worried about. These always expand and have a significant effect on peripheral vision, but even the little mild, tiny laser spots we put in the macula over time can cause damage. And there is, at this point, no reversing that Ironically, this department, along with others, are working on some stem cells. Henry Klassen and Jing Yang, who are over in the stem cell building, or both professors in our department, are working on stem cells for retinitis pigmentosa, but they're interested in applying it to diabetic retinopathy and macular generation to see if we can reverse some of this damage. But right now, there is no reversing of that damage. For now, this is what we are, we're stuck with this. So that's why we're trying to balance it out. Less laser. Balanced out with the injections, though we're afraid that the injections are very short-lived, the laser lasts longer, but has these complications over time. Well, why don't you talk about it from a systemic standpoint, because uh, you're okay, talking about sure. personalized medicine in a certain sense. Yeah. Uh, this is what we call precision medicine. It'll be for the future. Uh, just take diabetes, for example. So far, there are over 300 genetic defects has been identified for diabetic patients, So, which means that not every two diabetes patients uh, have the, exactly the identical genetic defect. You likely have a diabetes, a complex disease. Uh, a lot of time, it's not a defect in one single gene. It's a defect in multiple genes. So we, have, we are still learning about this. As we learn more and more about it, about the, gen the relationship uh, between genetic, uh, genetics and the diabetes and diabetic complications, we will be better uh, be able to kind of uh, tailor-made or custom-made uh, any specific therapy to our diabetic patients because a, any kind of therapy, what we want is the treatment will be effective in treating diabetes or diabetic complications, but at the same time without the side effect. Uh, 
but we are not quite there yet. In the next 10 years, I think we are going to learn a lot from all these precision medicine initiatives and will be able to offer uh, better treatment. In, a co in corollary to that, I have a laboratory in Hewitt right across the way that I share with uh, Dr. Kenny, Professor Christina Kenny, and we're actually working on this co same idea, but we're taking from patients that we see here, that I see here in this building, removing some of their blood from their from peripheral blood, and we take out their mitochondria from their uh, from the platelets, and we take the mitochondrial mitochondria and put it into cells and culture, and we're able to study mitochondrial genetics and how it plays a role in expression of our normal. So our, most of our genetics is so-called nuclear genome, but the mitochondria, which are the powerhouses inside each cell, have their own genome, and we're discovering more and more. Uh, so we're testing patients to see which drug they're most likely to respond to by taking a blood sample and testing it in the laboratory. So we're still a couple of years away, but our goal is to do those tests and then decide, for example, should somebody be on ILEA versus, well, I don't think we're going to be able to tell, maybe we'll be able to tell between ILEA, Lucensis, and Avastin, but should they be on one of those versus a steroid, a totally different class of drug. So we are working on ways in our laboratory here of creating a precision medicine where we can help guide therapy and have that available in the next couple of years. Can I add something? Sure. Okay. So uh, if you are interested, um, the Diabetes Center is a part of the NIH nationwide uh, precision medicine initiatives. Uh, we are already starting to enroll patients, and these patients, when they got enrolled in our project, you will go through full genome sequencing uh, in your uh, genetics as well as only all other uh, health data will be compiled with millions of other Americans who participate in this study. And over the long run, we are hoping that this will become a launch pad for precision medicine in the future. Great. Well, they working ages, of course, tends to be a, that's expanding over time, you know. <laughs> 70 is the new 60, et cetera, et cetera. People used to retire at a certain age. so. Those numbers are probably out of date, but the, the reason that that's referred to even at all is that the, the impact, not to minimize it, but when complications happen to retirees, they, while that is sad and tragic, it has less of an impact on the, on the economics of society as when they're working age people, the younger they are. So that's why that is referred to. It's really more of an, it's not meant to be a value judgment, it's an economic analysis so that people pay attention to working age. When a worker can no longer go to work because of their vision problems, that has a different impact economically than when a retiree can't, can't see their loved ones. That's sad, but it has a, less, a different imp economic impact. That's why those analyses are done that way. So um, I didn't really address it much, so again, as I, but just to reiterate a little bit, and then I'll get into a little more detail, diabetics have an increased risk of cataract than the general population. And of course, diabetic, diabetes is also a disease of age. Over time, people are more likely to get developed diabetes. And cataracts are also a disease of age. And so you, sometimes you get an, uh, you know, somebody who has a cataract that's caused by either diabetes or their age or both. Ironically, we can actually sort of tell the difference. The natural lens in the eye has a large central seed. It's a little bit like I described the uh, lens as, a, as a, an avocado squished into the shape of a, an M&M. So it's got a thick skin around it, the capsule. It's got a big meaty part, the cortex, and then a big seed in the middle, the nucleus. And the aging cataract is that big seed in the middle begins to turn yellow. Whereas the diabetic cataract is in the meaty part, there's, sp there's spokes called cortical spokes. And so if we see spokes and yellowing in the middle, we think both diabetes and, and age cause that cataract. Either way, whatever caused the cataract, the surgery itself is the same process. But what is relevant for the why it's why why it mixes this, you know, the pro creates more problem is that the act of surgery in the eye contributes to the inflammation in the eye. And since the diabetic retinopathy, the macular edema, is already caused by these inflammatory cytokines, VEGF, the interleukins, and the other compounds, more of those are released and simulated by the cataract surgery. So you can have a real worsening of that swelling in the back of the eye. So much so that we frequently will inject drug into the eye to control the swelling before the cataract surgery in anticipation of the cataract surgery to smooth the perioperative period, that is, the period of time surrounding the surgery 
to minimize the likelihood of developing macroedema, but it's the inflammation caused by the cataract surgery. It compounds, exacerbates the inflammation already in the diabetic retina. Um, we are seeing it more and more. I would say uh, 30 years ago, uh, you really have people who have reversal of type 2 diabetes. But in this day and age, if you do a good job in losing weight and watch your diet, and even to one extreme, if you do, let's say, bariatric surgery that they, they take out a part of your stomach, uh, there is um, some good data to support that, yeah, sometimes diabetes can be reversed in type 2. But weight, lo weight loss being uh, the most common way to achieve that. Yes. And just take uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, pre-diabetes, for example. The progression from pre-diabetes to diabetes, 50% of them can be prevented just by lifestyle management alone. Well, it's 8 o'clock. I'm glad. To, well, I want to make sure that you're all aware of that and so you're free to go. But if anybody have any other questions, I'm glad to stick around for another few minutes. But thanks so much for your attention. Thank you, Dana, for organizing this. And welcome. And um, thank you so much for attending.